if we do have uh, if we do have an emergency, there's an exit door here. There's exit doors on the side. And there's an exit door in the back. Um, if you need to use the restroom, there is a uh, restroom here, uh, and then there's also a public restroom that is unlocked. Correct? Yeah. Yep. So there's a public restroom through those back doors. Uh, the way we'd like to carry on the, the evening is this: there's six presentations to be done tonight. If you have any questions or comments, if you could just hold those to the end of that particular presentation, and then we'll just have a little question and answer session at the end of that. Okay? And before on Zoom, if you would use the chat box to ask your question as we go, and Brian and I will monitor that. And we are recording tonight's presentation and it'll be available on the Kinesis Lake YouTube channel probably tomorrow. Fantastic. If you could get that done by eight in the morning, that would be great. <laughs> I, want to, I want to show my seventh graders this because I did not have time to plan their lesson in the <laughs> So yeah, so everybody, welcome to uh, Livonia's global environment. I will tell you, after teaching for 18 years, oh, now oh, I get it. and now environmental science for the last seven okay. Uh, okay. Uh, aspects of this course, want to yell at them? I'll yell at them. Hey, people at home, you. Thank you. <laughs> I, can um, I feel like one of the most important things that we can do for today's youth and everybody really is to get them outside appreciating nature because if you don't appreciate what it is you have to lose then you're probably not going to make efforts to protect it right and I feel like one of the best ways I can go about do that is getting the kids out outside as much as possible uh, and there isn't a better place to do that than I that I feel than Livonia's campus it's an amazing campus it's 120 acres We've got forests, we've got wetlands, we've got creeks, we've got open fields, successional fields, really an awesome place to work. And I feel blessed to be there and honored to have this group of kids who have worked really hard over the last five months to, to do the presentations they're doing tonight. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a picture of Livonia's wetlands. Uh, it's about a nine acre wetland that you'll hear quite a bit about tonight, how they work, what we're worried about with them, things we're learning about it, really fantastic. And what you'll notice here, if I can point this out, so somewhere right about here, it's kind of become a tradition every year, they don't realize this, but during the first rain event that I have my students with and they don't believe me that we're going out, rain, snow, sleet, or hail, we go out in the rain, snow, sleet, and hail, right? Uh, snow coming up this Friday, hopefully, right? Some nice cold weather. But to show you a picture of that, this was kind of our first day with this crew where we were outside. Um, and so these are the people who will be presenting to you tonight. And one of the ways I measure the success in this class, honestly, it's really, uh, they don't recognize how much I'm kicking and giggling inside. When we go outside and we take them through the woods, everyone is so dainty, right? They're like so worried about every little thing and they're trying to get out of the way of everything. And by the end of the year, they're just plowing through it, which is what I want them to do in the first place. All right, but to give you an idea of what that looks like, I'm just gonna play you this quick little video clip. I don't think the students have seen this yet, or maybe they have some of them. Nope. Go oh, Anna, come on. Come on. I don't think I can make it. Oh, you can do it. Oh. I don't think I can. You literally just like. Oh, no. Littering. Littering. Turtle. What are you doing? Oh, Mrs. G just got a waterfall. All right, so how about you guys offer hands here for people trying to get up? I got it. All right. Careful, it's muddy. All right, Mrs. G. Ready? Two hands. Well, hang on. You got a vine around your right foot. You got a vine around your right foot. All right, Colby, Colby, give her a hand. Nice. I have boot water in one boot, which is terrible. There you go. Nice. He wanted to push me. Just don't pull him. Just don't pull him. Nice. Help him. I don't have any water in my shoes. Oh, Leah, you're Great. Right. People up on this top side, when Danny makes her big step, offer your hand to help pull her up the hill. All right, that's part of what this class is about. R.I.P. Sock pair number two. All right, guy, get up here. Look at Danny go. There you go. 
Hold on, Danny. I'd, I'd use his hand. Right on the black. You got it. Is she gonna make it? I would. Yeah, just kind of jump, cause you're. Uh, get your other hand out. Get your other hand out. Oh no. Big leaps. Danny, you can make it. You're feeling it. Oh yeah. Nice, nice, oh, yeah. nice, nice, nice. Yeah. We got a wet hopper. <laughs> Hey Charlie, we got some people in the waiting room there. Looks like, or at least it's coming up on the screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nope. Um, before we get going, so with the pandemic being what it is, this course is usually very field trip oriented, right? We go as many places as, as I could possibly get to, but with us being limited and in a semester system, uh, we decided, and I'm very thankful that my administration team allowed me to do this. I pulled in a lot of professionals, right, to see that uh, there are people out there in the real world doing this stuff and give them an opportunity to interact. And so I'd like to just take a quick moment to review some of those people. This is uh... Charlie, can we, uh... yeah, we're moving. We just got to move that window. There yeah. we go. Perfect. So I apologize to crew back there. This is not you, but I did not have a picture of Hillary Moser. She's an invasive species uh, expert. And she came to our dinner. Yeah. To teach us. To teach us about the invasive species. How do I get all that? You got to meet the I think he's going to be. Say what? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm muted according to me. Somebody else in the room has to move. Someone else in the room has a Zoom meeting open. Yeah, everybody has to be muted there. Yeah, we good? All right, sorry about that, everybody. All right, see my eardrums. Five years from now, we're going to have this down pole. Uh, so Hillary came to our campus, taught us how to uh, identify invasive species and then use IMAP invasives, which is a citizen science means of getting your actual observations out there in the real world for legitimate scientists to use in our, uh, in our war on invasive species. We also had, uh, whoops, now it's not letting me advance. There we go. Bryce June, a forester from the DEC, came out and talked to us about reforesting a two-acre section of plot, uh, land we have on our campus that has been decimated by the Eastern Ash Borer. And we're looking at means of uh, what's the process? What do we have to do to get ready? What kind of plants do we bring in? In the hopes that uh, we can make that two acres actually a viable, maybe lumber production or recreation area in the future. Uh, these three came out. We had a fantastic day. Matt Haven is here. These are all people who work with the Natural Resource uh, Council. We have Matt Haven. We have uh, Zach Warning and then Josh Hibbett is an invasive species, species specialist who uh, came to us from Hawaii and uh, they came and brought us in the woods and taught us all about soils. So we're really excited about that. Dr. Jackie Malinowski is a sedimentologist over at SUNY Geneseo. And she came and talked to us about the coring of Canisius Lake and it inspired one of our research topics that you all will see tonight. So I'm very thankful that they were there. Um, this is uh, really clean compared to what it usually is. These are the boots outside my room, and they're usually scattered all over the place, uh, lots of mud everywhere. And so I want to take this opportunity to thank um, our custodians, our administration, and our office staff. There's an awful lot of going outside, breaking up in groups, and just doing things that I can't imagine being allowed to do in lots of other schools. When I tell people what I do, they're like, are you crazy? We would never be able to do that for you. So I really appreciate it for those folks behind the scenes. We have uh, Sheila Ballone, our head custodian. We have Jimmy Mixon, uh, so he's one of our main custodians. We got John Down, our principal, Megan Hogg, our director, the director of instruction. Uh, we got Paula Moore, the person who cleaned my room and really should hate me, but she still seems to like me every day, so that's good. Uh, Dr. Kelsey, who's been a great support of this program and coming in and seeing the kids. He actually put, uh, came in this morning to watch them and give them some advice. Uh, and then the office people, holy cow, they're dealing with me all the time. Uh, having to miss seminar, having to do this. We've got Laura Dragone, Sandy Patterson, the heart and soul of Livonia. She literally runs the place. 
And then I uh, kind of covered up, I hope it's not covered up for you, but Jack McGonagall was really dealing with attendance issues and trying to catch me out in the field on the cell phone saying, hey, so and such there. And uh, to be honest with it, I miss a lot of her calls. She's just incredibly patient with me. Um, and then the last one. This is uh, Tony Garbasic. <laughs> literally uh, has made this class what it is this year. I could not do this without her. I've worked with Tony for a couple of years now, um, but she is a teacher's aide there to kind of help one person out, two people out, three people out, but she literally helps me run this class, gives me an opportunity to say, hey, I'm taking U6 over here and leave U6 in the building. So thank you, Tony, if you're out there. I really appreciate uh, all your help through the years. So, uh, just about ready to roll here. I just want to point out that we have three goals with this environmental class. The first one, the first one is that we learn how to perform genuine research. The second one is that we collect data and we try to use, utilize that for the community and by the community. And the last one is we communicate that research publicly outside the classroom, which is where all of you come in and all of you there at home come in. So, uh, if we could, I'd just like to take a brief second so that the students here see who's out there in the audience. And I don't know if people in the audience know how to raise their hand or not uh, on Zoom, but if you know how to do that, please do that. That'll be on the recording so we can see. Um, so I'm going to list uh, several lines of uh, descriptors. If it fits you, if you're welcome to raise your hand more than once, uh, please raise your hand so the students can see this. So the first one is, are there parents or siblings of a presenter in the room? Hey, look at that, kind of figures this year, huh? <laughs> right, a teacher, past, present, or future in the room. Look at that, current college or high school students. Nice, that's all of you, good job. You guys really <laughs> good. Uh, and you, you all should know that there are three former ESF students in this class who are in college right now, zooming in because they were in your shoes. Not that long ago, right? So they're, they're not very excited for you tonight. Um, interested community member. There we go. Livonia administrator or board member. They're mostly online. We do have Dr. Calzi there, and I saw a couple others. So thank you for being here. And then uh, I've interacted with these students directly. That's probably all of you in some way, shape, or form, I would imagine, right? And uh, with that said, let the games begin. So. Here we go, Elliot, your moment. So this first presentation is by Elliot Gavin, and she is going to talk to you about land use history in Lavonia. So if you come forward to me, okay. Hi, I'm Elliot Gavin, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the land use history of Livonia. I chose the topic of land use because I've always been very interested in history in general, and I wanted to see what the land has impacted on us. To start, I'd like to take you before the Europeans came here in the 1600s. Before the Europeans started showing up in the 1600s, Europe was occupied by the Iroquois Nation. They lived in small tribes and villages, so there was no dense area of people. The landscape was mostly forest with high biodiversity, um, and they achieved this by having many different resources. They were hunters, fishers, gatherers, and farmers, and they lived sustainably, so they only farmed what they needed and what they needed. Um, they had no real environmental impact, so, however, once uh, the Europeans started showing up and having more permanent settlements in the 1800s, the land and the Iroquois started to undergo a massive change. This map shows quite clearly that European settlement moved from east to west. So you can see that right here, the left on the map, you can see that the settlement is in the west, and that is mostly concentrated in the east near Spring section, which is the north line, which you can look at it. Slowly it moves westward in interesting shapes. And I think those interesting shapes could be because of soil, terrain, and water and water sources. I'd like to key in on Western New York now. Lakes are great landmarks to know where you are on that. So I'm just gonna give you guys a few different 
Let's see how you do. It's right there. And this land race is the shape. Includes um, it includes Livonia and it was settled in 1790. I was interested in going to the first place that for seller of this, which was Helen Kudra. The picture means the sign. He lived on the corner of Bethel Road and this is what the land looks like today. And I was especially interested in this to buy or curve right here. And I think the main reason for that curve is because of the soil. So you can see that yellow light from the street. Yeah. This is a soil map, and you can see you can see spacious space right there. And before I talk about that curve plan, I talk about the mass plan. I just want to point out that it's a legend. Um, almost all of the soil categories are influenced by Swiss glaciers. So you have some of the soil. So glaciers have affected our landscape today. Back to that yellow curve plan. Above it is limey soils, and below it are basophic soils. And limey and thick soils are both good for farming. However, limey soils are better. So it makes sense that that land was settled first. Um, and they were mostly concerned with farming. So what's the first thing a settler would need to do to build a farm? The answer to that, of course, is to clear land for farm. On the left, you can see the cut, the sun starting to cut, and what the forest used to be. Mm. And on the right, you can see an established farm. Practice this one. So you just have to practice giving it some more belly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, they would use the timber for structures, but also for to clear room for fields and crops. On a small scale for a farm or two, this would not be a big deal. However, as settlement continued in the 1800s, it led to the great deforestation of New York. Um, this, this graph shows the fluctuation in land, forest land cover over the years. So you can see in the year 1600, they had 30 million acres, and slowly as the Europeans started having more involvement, it went down to 10 million acres, and that's about a two thirds loss in their forest land area. And some of the repercussions of having such a low forest um, land cover could be more erosion, less biodiversity, and less natural resources. So clearly, this was a big problem that needed to be addressed. One man who helped reforest New York was Franklin B. Huff. He was one of the he was one of the first people who pushed for the passing of the first environmental program to protect forests. Because of his work, in 1911, the Conservation Department was formed. It was a predecessor to the, to the DEC, and it helped um, protect all of the environment. In 1929, there was a State Reforestation Act. And one way they were able to achieve this reforestation is because of the, due to the Great Depression, many people abandoned their farmland, so they planted secondary growth forests on abandoned farms. This can even be seen, seen in the 1938 aerial of the Lillian. Just to get you oriented on this map, the green line is Lucatine and Teal line is Shelly Road. The red dot is where the high school would be later. And you can see the square secondary growth forest right here. Yes. Okay. And in these next few slides, I would like to show you how this land developed. In 1954, the woods can, can be seen clearly curling around into the wetlands. And you can see that there was some development with the varsity softball field. 
However, the main use of land is still agriculture. And the building of the current high school would bring drastic changes when it was built in 1969. This is a picture of 1960 and 1944. And you can see that the woods are filling in. The school has been built, and the school has even taken up a little bit of that corner of that secondary growth forest. Um, this land, however, would undergo many changes to get rid of the clay. Also, you can see the parking lot, and that would under that would undergo many renovations. In 1990, the school grounds as well as the village grew. The woods are pretty much now mature, and you can see oh, at the bottom, still, there's a new woods filling in. And one thing that has stayed the same throughout this series of slides is the continual use of farmland. In Livonia, the land has almost always been altered to produce the best conditions for farming. This is a picture of South South Carolina in the mid 1800s, and they drained a much they drained a wetland, which basically means they ditched a wetland, so they could grow celery, potatoes, and onions. The parallels can be seen today in this picture from Cicero Farms. This is when they were growing their potatoes. However, one thing that's drastically different from farms back then and farms today is farms now offer a wide variety of produce. You can see that they offer onions, peppers, squash, tomatoes, and an emphasis of potatoes. So clearly, farming has been a key player in the landscape development of Bologna. However, many industries have come and gone throughout the years. This is a picture of 1859, and you can see the school is the blue dot. Um, one of the most prominent things on this map is the railroad. And it helps Livonia grow in population and commerce. So on the top left is an illustration of a train from 1836. And at the bottom is a photograph of a steamer in hot topic. They both ran on coal, and you can see the bad, you can see how much smoke they would have. And that caused a bad environmental impact to our air and our land. Because because of this um, industry, they want to grow even more. So they would end up splitting off right there in that few lots to accommodate for a solar. This is a picture of 1990. This is a year after the salt line was built. And you can see where it split off right there. And it helps commerce, it employed a lot of people. However, it eventually shut down due to competition from Rexall. Um, you can see that smokestack right there, so that they had bad environmental impact. And because of this increase in industry, it, um, our water bodies were being affected. This can be seen in the Locust Creek study of 1966. Dr. Herman S. Forrest, um, who was a biologist from T. Josio, professor, uh, wanted to test if Locust Creek, which is an inlet in Livonia of Canisius Lake, had a significant impact on the pollution that was being caused in Canisius Lake, because Canisius Lake had most of the most of the water. He asked families to use class rate three detergent for two years. From his results, he found that Locust Creek does have a significant impact on Canisius Lake. Further studies of Wilkins Creek can be seen today, even in our classes. This is a picture of me and my classmate. Um, that's not me, but <laughs> my yeah, yeah. But my teacher and my classmate they play natural vertebrates, and natural vertebrates can be used to determine the water quality of the stream, and there will also be proteins left in there. But one thing I'm very grateful to learn about this class is not only how the environment works, but understand a deeper um, understanding and appreciation for the environment. That's one of my favorite pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Laura. Yeah.
Does anyone here or at home have any questions for Elliot? While you're thinking of them, I do want to say that uh, this is a tough one to put together because she did absolutely tons of research and she found out all sorts of cool little things about the bone that I'm thankful for, uh, like the wetland you're going to see a little bit later here. We believe that was an ice skating rink. Uh, had a great time talking with Elliot about the railroad line and looking where it is today and just amazed at how well nature heals and is able to take care of uh, some of the big scars that we tend to put down on it. So if you went and looked at that salt line today, it is literally uh, covered with a successional forest. Uh, so I appreciate all the work that you did, Elliot, and uh, had a great time. So any questions for Elliot? It's just great to have Elliot from Linda Archers. All right. Good job, Elliot. Thank you for being here. Okay, so next up, uh, we have Shane Walid and Colby Percy. And uh, I'm really thankful that they took interest in this project because this is something I've been talking about for uh, many years, investigating. And they kind of jumped on it and on their uh, own desires, went and figured out the that. I'm not going to take that away from Okay, I'm okay with that. Are you guys comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Shane Malid. I'm Colby Percy. And our presentation is called The Culver's Conundrum. In our presentation, we will discuss a problem that we had right on our Lamoni campus involving these two culverts. So, first, what is that problem? The problem is Water from an unknown source is flowing into and possibly contaminating Wilkins Creek. Uh, right here, the white building is our school. And just west of that, these two red dots represent those two mystery culprits along with Wilkins, uh, Wilkins Creek right here. Now, for those of you who don't know what Wilkins Creek is, Wilkins Creek is a tributary of Canisius Lake. The creek flows through agricultural, forested, and developed lands at the start of it, it flows through these green barbed lands, then goes through yellow rural lands. Uh, and also right here, the blue is on uh, school's campus. So why is it important that we keep this creek clean? It is important because everything that flows through Wilkins Creek upstream will end up in Canisius Lake. If you take a look at the map here, the start of the creek is 1,230 feet above sea level. At our school's property, it's 1,100 feet above sea level. And when it reaches Canisius Lake, it's 820 feet above sea level. The main concept is less pollution in Wilkins Creek equals less pollution in Canisius Lake. What do I mean by pollution? One big environmental pollutant is parking lot runoff water. However, we have came up with some solutions for that, such as retention ponds and wetlands. So in New York State, any parking lot bigger than one acre requires a retention pond or wetlands to drain into you. Here is our retention pond on campus and our detention pond on campus. Both of these were put in when the tennis courts were put in on our school campus. Why the wetlands? Well, wetlands actually have many natural functions you can't necessarily find anywhere else. Uh, this is our wetlands on campus. These arrows are representing inflow from the hill located there. Then this is the outlet into Wilkins Creek. Wilkins Creek. That's important to understand because on this graphic, we have the same situation going on where we have inflow from the hill, we have groundwater flow, and then the two main functions of the wetlands is gonna be uh, sediment being filtered and bacteria being broken down. Then you're gonna notice the outlet into a stream and then the slow release of stored water like a sponge into the creek. Uh, here's our wetlands from like a drone perspective. Here's a culvert that our parking lot used to drain into the wetlands. This is what initially raised some concern for us because we want the parking lot to be drained into the wetlands to properly filter that water. Like you just mentioned, here is the culvert that is now uh, out of service. It is out of service because in the year 2000, our parking lot was repaved for better draining. Uh, however, this left this culvert out of service and buried 
making us wonder where all 3.2 acres of the parking lot water is now draining towards. To get a better scale of that, we have created a chart which has inches of rain per hour uh, to gallons of rain collected per hour. We will use the baseline one inch of rain an hour uh, equals 84,721 gallons. Now, if you were to have an 18 foot by 18 foot, four foot deep pool, that pool would fill with 7,646.4 gallons. That means in one, one inch of hour can fill 11 average residential swimming pools. Now to put that in a yearly perspective, we get, uh, we average around 34 inches of precipitation. So 374 of these pools can be filled with our yearly precipitation from our parking lot. So the culverts, here we're going to have the two culverts we discovered on campus, and then here is the old culvert that used to drain into the wetlands. Both of these culverts are draining water from the east to the west in the school into Wilkins Creek. First up, we have culvert number one. Culvert one is constantly flowing water. When we tested a five gallon bucket to fill, it filled in 36.5 seconds at a low flow rate. Uh, you can notice that the water is sudsy gray, as well as the water also pulses randomly when coming out of the culvert. Uh, culvert number two is going to be generally inactive against unless it's in like a big rain event. As you can see, there's sediment buildup all around the entrance and into the ice. The storm drains. So we decided to track some storm drains that were leading up to these culverts. They're in a linear pattern west to east. Uh, here's our school, obviously, and then this arrow we have representing the parking lot. So you would think it's got to go straight to the parking lot. So we decided to look at some blueprints of when the parking lot was originally paved. And we discovered that here are all eight of our storm drains. And then you have the arrows pointing all into this southeast corner into the wetlands. So we decided, well, here's a better picture of that. As you can see, they're all draining into that southeast corner. So we decided we need to take a better look at the managers. So since we now know that uh, these, these manholes in the culvert do not lead to our parking lot, we really wanted to figure out what they led to. We are going to take a look inside now, starting from the east, working our way down from the west. So first up, we have manholes number nine and eight. Pay close attention to the lower green pipeline as well as the higher black pipeline. As we move from nine to eight to seven to six, you'll notice kind of the same structures within except something interesting with number six is you'll notice the green pipeline and the black pipeline both come together into one manhole. As we move to five and four, you'll notice this again with number four, as there's the green manholes or green uh, pipes, I should say, underneath, as well as the black pipe, which is actively pouring water. We'll, met, we'll now move to number two and one where it is just the green pipeline moving water down towards the, uh, the culverts. And that is the same green pipe that you'd see at the culverts. Now, when looking in these manholes, we notice something uh, particularly interesting with number five and number four. So with number five, you will see there's two black pipes, one actually coming from our school and the other one leading to the culverts. Now this made us wonder why was the pipe coming from our school and why does it have to go to the culverts? Again, this is the water actively pouring out of that black pipe and right to the culverts. And then that made us come up with our, what we think is the answer that this water is actually coming from the roof. So this is our high school roof. It is 5.04 acres. That's nearly two acres bigger than our park. This is a map right here. Uh, these are 41 stream, storm drains that we covered on 2.6 acres of our roof. Notice the linear patterns, which would make sense for uh, easy draining. And then to get a close up on these drains, here's one. As you can see, there's kind of leaf buildup all around it and standing water. And then you should just notice the linear pattern of these drains. Another interesting thing we found is within our schools, within the walls, there's actually pipes coming down 
from the dreams on top of the roof, which helped us to better conclude that we believe the mystery water is actually roof water. However, due to the season change, we are unable to fully uh, complete our research, but we hope to continue our research in the spring in order to confirm our beliefs as well as find out data that will help future projects done on the boat. So, either online folks or anybody here in the room, do we have any questions for Shane or Colby? We have a comment. Can you read us the comment? Good job, guys. Good job, guys. Again, fantastic visuals, maps, and images. Your questions and research done to address them were fascinating, very professional and informative. And I think that was from Zach and from Linda. Great visuals, interesting info about the drains and culture. Very nice. So, where is this today? Uh, when you guys went and asked questions about the roof water, did anyone know where it was going? So it's, it's a legit, uh, legit mystery, everybody, moving forward. The school does not currently have any blueprints of that. Uh, and since we do have a capital project coming up in 2024, uh, we hope that we can kind of address this address this issue because the 374 pools at five acres is going to be more than 374 pools a year. Right, so thank you for your investigative work. I appreciate your efforts, gentlemen. Go get him, Shane. Shane's off to a hockey game, everybody. <laughs> What's the camera project? Well, I'm here about it. Yeah. Okay, so next up, um, this is one of the, this is one, of, this is our largest group. This had six people involved here, so uh, a lot of moving parts on this one. And unfortunately, we were kind of COVID interrupted. We lost some people partly along the way, and then there's one who's currently in quarantine. Um, so we have Ch uh, Caden is going to. Last minute, I threw this at him and I said, hey, can you fill in this, this little gap here? And so they've done a great job putting together a story about macroinvertebrates. I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Luke. I'm Ryan. And this is macroinvertebrates and water quality. This is an overview, overview of our presentation. So me and Ryan are doing the Lucas Creek subwatershed. Uh, what are stream microinvertebrates? That's going to be done by Kate. And then data collection methods. That was by Chase, but it's going to be present, presented by Kate. Uh, results and what they mean by Kelly and Anna. It's going to be presented by Anna. And then, yeah, future work. What is a watershed? Um, a watershed is a drainage basin in any area of land where precipitation collects and drains off into a common outlet, such as into a river, bay, or any other body of water. So the precipitation would collect on that red dotted line and go into that common outlet, like that river. The Canisius Lake watershed. The Canisius Lake watershed is this right here. This is it. And then if you, it's Pretty much every inch of land is part of the watershed. And so this is the huge lake one, and then that's made up of a bunch of other sub watersheds, and those all flow into Canisius Lake. And then that right there is the sign for the Canisius Lake or the Wilkins Creek Water Sub Watershed, which is part of the Canisius Lake watershed. And so do you think you can guess where that is? Uh, see how you did. Right there. Uh, Wilkins Subwatershed. It's approximately um, 1,500 acres long, 3% of total drainage um, basin, the lake. Uh, extends 3.1 miles from Lakeville to South Livonia. Sections of Wilkins have been ditched in the past, which is important to know here. Riffle, run, and pool. 
A ripple is more of a forceful flow of water, which rocks and material underneath are being shown, are being shown and bubbles are created. And so that's a ripple right there. A run is a steady flow of water that the water is slow enough to not sh show exposing rocks in the stream bed. And that's one right there, it's pretty much the water just flowing. And then a pool is a cell area of water in a curve or deep part of the stream bed. And that's one right there. And these are only found in the natural section of the creek. And that's a part of our creek right there, Wilkins Creek. You can see some ripples right around here. Okay, so there's a ditch section and a natural section. The ditch section has no ripples. Um, essentially, it's all run. The only ripples were created by tree fall. And the natural section has many ripples dotted throughout the stream. The ditch, the ditch section has a soft, sandy bottom. And the natural section has rocky bottoms, as you can see. So, Wilkins Creek is made up of two sections. There's the ditch section, which is what's going to be seen here. It's pretty straight and some straight tur turns right there. But as soon as you cross the road, it becomes a natural section. And you can see the ditch section right here is very straight. The natural section just kind of weaves around naturally. And so the ditch section was man made a long time ago by farmers, pretty much just move the water where they want it to go instead of like all over their fields. So it just goes straight and technically just like. And so living in these in our creek are macroinvertebrates, which is what Kate's gonna be talking about next. All right, so uh, what are metric macroinvertebrates? Well they're mostly larval species of different insects. And to break down what benthic macroinvertebrates mean, benthic means bottom dwelling. So you can see this diagram of a dragonfly and spent, uh, spends parts of its life uh, in the water. And uh, macro means you can see them without a microscope, and invertebrate means they don't have a microscope. So there's four main categories of benthic macroinvertebrates. So there's insects, and here's a beetle. Uh, there's crustaceans, here's an example of a scud. Uh, analids, and here's an example, which is an aquatic worm, and there's mollusks, and here's some plants. These benthic macroinvertebrates also have different ways that they feed, uh, and those are called functional feeding groups. So one of those is the shredders, and what they do is they eat leaves and they get nutrition from the fungi and the bacteria. So here are two popular ones, the caddis fly and the stone fly. Another kind is collectors, and they get small pieces of leaves and feces from the shredders. So this is a black fly. What, the, what it does is it sticks to uh, the bottom of the stream, and as things flow by, it catches the food in its antenna. And here's a net spinner, and so it builds a silk net, and as things flow down the stream, it gets caught in this net, and uh, that's how it gets food. Another kind is a scraper, and they feed on algae. So here's a snail and limpet, so there's a couple examples. And last are predators, and they eat smaller organisms nearly whole. They have a hinge jaw to eat bigger prey. So here's a Corydalidae that we found in Wilkins Creek, and here's also a dragonfly. Uh, so this is interesting because in the 1970s, a scientist named Robin Vanoak came up with the idea of the river continuum. And this idea is that all creeks, streams, and rivers start at high elevation and they end in a body of water. And as you move downstream, the conditions of the stream are going to change as well as the microinvertebrates. <clears throat> so uh, at higher elevation, there's going to be more shredders, and there's going to be collectors to follow because there's going to be higher elevations with uh, more tree cover. So that's why the shredders are going to be there for more uh, leaves and stuff to feed on. And as you move downstream, you see you're going to see more grazers and collectors as well. So our theory is that this would hold true uh, on Wilkins Creek. As you see, here's the higher elevation and it moves in the lower elevation. So next, uh, we had to go about what we would do to find the macroinvertebrates. And we had three different methods. And those are the natural leaf pack, uh, which you can see there, uh, constructed leaf pack, and the uh, kick net. So first I'm going to be talking about the natural leaf pack. Uh, these are collected leaf packs where there's tree cover. And this is a qualitative study. So you can see, um, 
that I'm collecting the leaves from the stream, and this is what it looks like in the stream, just uh, leaves building up. So next are constructed leaf packs, and they're built to control the experiment. This is quantitative because we can evaluate how much of uh, each leaf was eaten. Using each constructed leaf pack, we put 10 grams of oak, 10 grams of maple, and 10 grams of hickory leaves. So uh, we place these leaf packs in ripples that have the best chance of collecting macros, because that's where the most water flow is. And uh, but sad news, this was not successful because the leaf packs became uh, dried out and the big section turned out to be relatively flat and there wasn't much ripple. And so uh, last thing we did was kick nap. And this was qualitative and quantitative because we had a one minute timeline. So here's a DNAT, this is what we would use. And uh, here's a video. Um, yeah, just a kick and it's okay to kick up some uh, pebbles in there too. and kick back samples. Um, we would put them in a small plastic bag and uh, put them in a cooler and bring them back to the class. And here you can see us digging through the leaf packs and picking up the microvertebrates. And so next thing we would do is we'd sort them out and uh, put them in different ice trays. All right, so then we, when we collected the uh, microvertebrates, we would identify them. So you can see them sorted out in a ice tray. And uh, yeah, we put them in a petri dish and we look at them under a microscope. And we also use identification charts to uh, help see which uh, background is which. So yeah, here you can see uh, one of the ice trays with a bunch of macros in it. And here's a video of a Corey holiday that we found in our stream. Yeah, we like go against each other. Like, like when he just calls out the colors through the wild. Yeah, it's just a video of it moving around. Hi, I'm Anna, and I'm going to be talking to you about our data that we collected. So here you can see this is a map of a GIS map. And um, here's the dish section, and in the green dots are the sites that we took our samples, and yellow is the natural section and the sites that we took our samples. And then we have Hayden taking a natural leaf pack sample. So what do macro macrovertebrates do, and where would they meet? So macrovertebrates have different tolerance levels for pollution and disturbances. And scientists use a benthic diagram as shown right here to determine what macroinvertebrates indicate what kind of water, water quality that they live in. And they're separated into three groups. So group one is intolerant and very sensitive to pollution. Group two is moderately sensitive to pollution. And group three is highly tolerant and not very sensitive to pollution. So let's look at what groups, what macroinvertebrates we had in each group. So group one, again, very sensitive to pollution. We have stonefly, caddisfly, mayfly, and ripple beetle. And then group twos, we had scud, eagle larvae, Crane fly. And in group three, we had aquatic worm, midge, bunk snail, black fly, and leech. So now that you know what microbirds we found in the debate, let's look at what some other data we meant. So here is a graph that we made of all of the macroinvertebrates that we found, and they're both in the ditched and natural section. 
And along this line, you can see the different colors. And each color represents the sample that we took. And then down here, you have all the macroinvertebrates. And you have group ones around here, group twos, and group threes. And as you can see, we do have a good number of group ones, which means that we do have overall high quality water in Wilkins Creek. But we wanted to know what different kinds of water quality we have in the ditch and the natural and see if there was a difference. So here's just the ditch. And again, we have the different groups, but you can see that we do have a pretty good number of group one macroinvertebrates, which means that we do have high quality water in the ditch section. And then the natural section, again, we do have a really good number of macroinvertebrates in group one, like stonefly and caddisfly, which also means we have high quality water. But let's look at the two graphs back to back. And the key points that we found were both sections have high quality water because of the group one um, macroinvertebrates that we found. And although the natural section did have more groups, more uh, macroinvertebrates total, and they did have more group one macroinvertebrates. But what we found was interesting was in the natural section, we did have more black flies. And in the dish section, we had very little. And a possible reason for that is that black flies, like we said, are filter feeders and they connect to the rocky bottom of the natural section. So we do have high quality water in Wilkins Creek, which is very good, but we do have some concerns. So one of our concerns is a future bus garage coming in in 2024. And as you can see here is where the school plans to put the bus garage and Wilkins Creek is right next to it. And there is a slope going down from the bus garage into Wilkins Creek. And we were interested to see if there was going to be a large impact on the bus garage into Wilkins Creek. But we also found something interesting. So as you see here, here's Shane and Colby's um, culvert. And we also wanted to know if that roof water from the culvert coming into Wilkins Creek was going to have an impact on Wilkins. So we found that if we took samples along Wilkins Creek where the culvert is, you can kind of see the culvert right behind right here. And you can see it coming in, the roof water coming in from Wilkins. And so we took water, we took samples from before the culvert, in the culvert, and after the culvert. And here is a video of what the water flow looks like on the day that we took the samples. And as you can see, there's a small amount of not a very high water flow. So the water flow is very small. And um, you can see right there, it's not very heavy. So let's look at the um, data that we found from the culvert. So here's our um, culvert graph. And we did have very little macroinvertebrate found. So in the yellow, right around here, you see very little macroinvertebrate life. And the culvert, although the culvert seems to have very little impact on the macro uh, population, as you can see in the red and blue is the before and after. And we believe that that has little impact because of the slow moving water that the culvert had coming into the stream on the day that we were sampling. So in the conclusion, our data suggests that we do have very little differences between the natural section and the ditch section of Locust Creek. And the culvert tributary draining possible roof water has very few macroinvertebrates, which suggests that we have poor water and poor water quality in the culvert. But due to the low flow of the culvert tributary does mean that the macroinvertebrates don't impact Wilkins, but for future work, we want to see what the impact of the cover is going to be in different flow conditions. And we also are going to, going to continue to do baseline data and data collecting on Wilkins Creek to, to evaluate what the future impact of the bus garage is going to be. Questions. Does anybody have any questions or if there's comments online? How many people out there besides my students have looked at macroinvertebrates before? Anybody? All right, a few of you. 
All right, they're kind of creepy, but they're really fun. And they definitely uh, show you a lot about the creek. Do we have any comments online? Uh, no. There are some handbrakes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Use the chat box, please. This is a little bit of a comment or a question here. Great job, Chad. Nice. This is our truce, it's all over you guys. Great job, Chad. Five jobs together. All right. Well done. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. All right, Caitlin, then you have to look around. Yeah, and probably like looking up periodically. So, uh, Caitlin and Leah were inspired by Dr. Malinowski and her work on Anusius Lake. Um, and since she was pouring the lake, these two very quickly afterwards, like, is that something we could do in the wetlands? And I'm like, girl. And so uh, this was really a uh, project of discovery. They just did a great job picking new paths, running into dead ends. to core the wetlands? Well, the first thing we were looking for was diatoms, which are small microscopic algae, which can be used to see various things about the water quality, such as pH and how much nutrients are in the water. Here's a few pictures of diatoms. We also wanted to determine the rate of sedimentation and erosion. And one of the things that would help us doing this was getting something to carbon date, such as a piece of wood, a leaf, or maybe a root. We also wanted to determine the history of the wetlands. For this, we were looking for windblown glacial sand, evidence of draining for the purposes of farming, and evidence that the wetland was once open water. But most importantly, we just wanted to know what was there. <coughs> So what exactly is a wetlands? Well, a wetlands is a place where the soil is saturated all year round and can host wetland obligate plants, such as sedges and cattails. This is a map of our school campus and school's right there, wetlands is right there. Let's zoom in on the wetlands. There, that line there is basically where the wetlands drains into Wilkins Creek. So for coring, we had to use some tools. The first tool was this post driver to push this plastic tube into the ground. Then we would remove the tube from the ground using this piece of rebar, which was initially straight. Then we would push the core out of the tube using this piece of threaded rod. The tube was also sanded down on the end in order to ensure that it would go into the ground easier. This is the part where we hammered the thing into the It's gonna start hurting in a second. That was the easy part. The harder part was removing the core from the ground. What's wrong with this thing? Did it not land? Yeah, that's fine.
Oh yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. We have core number two. Now the There was a minor hazard with pulling out the core, though, and that was the risk that your boots would get stuck in the mud. <laughs> Even a worse day, Tony. <laughs> no, dude, you've already gone this far. Just grab your boot. You got it. Why not? I, luckily, I have a stock for stock in my bag. You guys are your dummies. It's a good thing I have this tree. Yeah. I'm just gonna go with no socks for today. Maybe I was a coward for clinging to a tree, but it was funny from everybody's perspective but Tony's. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so that video right there shows us pushing out the corn using a drill. Sometimes we had to use the drill when the corn had a lot of clay in it, which meant it would be too hard to push out with our hands. Then we had to cut the core open. For this, we would use a razor blade to cut the core down the center several times, and we would clean off the blade each time in order to avoid contaminating. This is core A1. The top of the core is the muck, and about 40 centimeters below the muck is some gray stuff. Then, in order to find some diatoms, we made smear slides to examine under the microscope. The first part of this was putting distilled water on a microscope slide. And then we would add, use a toothpick to get some material from the core in order to, and then mix that with the distilled water. Then we would evaporate the water using a hot plate. Then once they were dry, we used a cement adhesive to stick a cover slip on. Then we would cure that under a UV light for 30 minutes, and then we could examine the slides and paint will present the results. Yep, so after we made the slides, we looked at them under the microscope, and the first thing we noticed was that, was that there were these little black specks throughout all of the slides, and we figured that this was just organic matter scattered throughout the core. And then other than that, we didn't really find anything that stuck out to us because everything to the left of this oxidation line that has an orange color had an orange color, and then everything to the right of that oxidation line was either gray or clear. But there was one thing that stuck out to us, and this was at 40 centimeters. We actually found cells. So here they are under the microscope. Here's another image. And at the time, we thought this was just contamination from cutting open the core or the slide making process. And so because we never found any diatoms, which is what we were initially looking for, and because we didn't really have a good grasp of what we were looking at, we had to figure out a new way to look at the cores. So this is where we come up with a process called washing. And so to wash a core, we took a small segment at first. Eventually, we ended up washing the whole half of the core. But initially, we took this segment because it had a lot of pebbles, and we wanted to see that internal structure. So we would take that segment and place it on a screen over a tray, and then slowly pour water over the, the sediment to move the fine grains into the tray and leave the coarse pebbles on top. So here is a video of that. Ooh, look how red that is. There's a lot of what, organics in there? I think you're And while we were washing for A1, we had found a root mass. Here are the cells under the microscope. And when we found this root mass, we were really excited because we had been looking for carbon material to or organic material to carbon date. And while working with Dr. Young, who is a retired professor emeritus of geology at SUNY Geneseo, who has recently done research on the glacial history of Western New York, he had said that this line right here 
is 13,000 years old when the last glaciers were here. And here it is zoomed in. And so we found the root mass right next to that. So we had hoped that the root mass would be just younger than 13,000 years. But unfortunately, after further consideration, we realized that we were looking at modern roots that had grown down into the soil. And we noticed this because they had a similar structure to the roots in the muck. So here are the core A1 roots, and then here are roots from the muck. And as you can see, they do have a similar structure. And on top of that, these roots are in a growing position around those pebbles. So we know that the pebbles were deposited first, because if the roots had been deposited with the pebbles, the roots would have been more fragmented and not in a growing position. And so even though this was a little disappointing that we couldn't carbon date this root mass, it did bring good news because the cells that I was talking about that we found on the smear slide were actually confirmed by this because we had taken the smear slide sample from the same location that we found the root mass. So these cells that we saw on the smear slide are actually roots from that root mass or cells from the root mass. So after looking at the coarse pebbles, we turned to look at the fine grains that were washed out of the core. And so we had expected to find iron in the core because it's being oxidized, giving it that reddish color, you can see. So to confirm this iron, we ran a magnet over that pile, and sure enough, material stuck to the magnet, confirming that iron is present in the core, and it gave it this prominent oxidation line. And on top of iron, we also expected to find windblown glacial sand. This is because, thanks to Dr. Young's research, we know that the last glaciers that were here were just north of Avon, putting Livonia at that southern edge of the glacier. And the southern edge is important because the cold air on top of the glacier is very dense and high pressure. So it blows down this pressure gradient underneath the warmer air on land, creating very strong winds. And so Livonia's location would be right here in the direct path of that strong wind. And then on top of that, windblown sand tends to collect in lower elevations and open bodies of water. And as you can see on this topographic map, there are two hills surrounding the wetlands, putting it at a lower elevation. And keep in mind, the ice sheet would be north of this, would be north of this, and the wind would be blowing south, collecting or the, and having the sand collect in the wetlands. And so then we took, we put the sand under a macroscope. So here is known windblown sand under the macroscope. And as you can see, the edges of those grains are rounded and frosted from hitting each other in the wind. And then here is the sand grain from core A1 right here. And as you can see, its edges are also rounded and frosted, telling us that that grain of sand has been in the wind at some point. And it's likely that it was in the glacial wind because we are south of the edge of the glacier and because, or, and this makes us wonder if the wetlands were at one point an open body of water because that's where sand tends to collect. And so after looking at these, we wanted to take more course. We took B and D course. So here's where we took core A1, and then the B and D cores were taken just south of that, and they fell, they fell beneath a runnel, which is covered up by that black box, but it's just a small runoff channel coming off of the slope, which would explain the larger grains that we're about to find in the B and D cores. So here the B and D cores line up from west to east, and don't be confused by the letters, it just means that we took them on different days. So on the B day, we went out and took cores, we took three cores 20 feet apart and marked them with ribbon, and we brought them in to analyze them. And after that analysis, we wanted to go back out and take D cores. So we took the D cores in between the B cores. So all of these cores are 10 feet apart. But right now it's difficult to see their internal, internal structure, so we washed them. And so after washing them, the first thing we noticed were, was that there were these large pebble layers and these are prominent energy pulses that can be represented by big rain events. So a rain event has enough energy and force to move larger pebbles down into the wetlands, creating these layers. And so initially we tried to line up these pebble layers, but it was difficult to confidently do so because these soil cores are just pinpoint locations and it's very difficult to line up those layers. And then we also noticed that some of these larger pebbles were very angular. And this stuck out to us because typically in a river, when pebbles are moving, they bang into each other and are rounded. But because these pebbles are not rounded, that tells us that they were not in the water long enough, even though that water was fast enough to move a pebble that size. So then we took a look at these cores individually. 
And in core D2, we found a root mass similar to that of A1. It was actually interesting because when we were interesting, because when we were washing this core, these pebbles fell right apart. But because these pebbles are held together by the roots, they stayed right on top of each other. And this is important because it shows how important roots are to soil stabilization and preventing erosion. And then in core D1, we found another thing that was interesting at 41 centimeters right there. And we actually found a crinoid fossil. So here it is in a petri dish. And it's very difficult to see right now because it is only two to three millimeters in diameter. So we stuck it under the macroscope. And here are identifiable crinoids. And as you can see, there's a star shape on one of them. And right here, you can kind of make out a star shape, but it's more, it is more difficult to do so because it has been in the glacial wing. So it's edges have been rounded and frosted. So it's a little bit more difficult to identify those characteristics. So right now you might be wondering what a crinoid is. And a crinoid is a living marine invertebrate that filters plankton through its feather-like arms in order to collect food to eat. Here is an intact fossil of a crinoid, and we are looking at one of the, oh, sorry, we are looking at one of these columnal discs. And so after looking at the B and D cores, we wanted to take more cores up that runnel. So here's a reminder of where everything was. And then here's another map. And as you can see, the runnel is a little bit more prominent in the snow because you can see the break in the tree line. So there's that runnel. And then we took core E1, E2, and E3 up the runnel to see if we would find more of those energy pulses or rain events. And so right now, core E2 is actually still stuck in its tube because while we were hammering it into the ground, the tube cracked. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out a way to get that core out without damaging it. But for now, we have washed core E3 and E1. So here's core E3. And while we were washing it, these clay layers appeared. And this is interesting because clay is definitely small enough to fit through the screen. It's just that when clay is compacted together, it's impermeable to water. So these layers appeared and stayed right on top of the screen. And then in core E1, we found more prominent energy pulses, which would make sense because it is in directly in that runnel channel that would experience uh, high uh, water flow. And then we also found a piece of chert right here at 58 centimeters, centimeters. Here it is up close. And chert is interesting because it has a microcrystalline structure that makes it very strong. And it was actually so strong that Native Americans would use it to make weapons like arrows or knives. And so the next steps in our project or future work would be to continue looking for organic material to carbon date. And we want to find out if the wetlands were at one point an open body of water like we suspect. And then ideally, we would dig a trench out in the wetlands so that we could go down in it and look at a wall of soil layers and confidently connect pebble layers as big rain events. And it would look something like that. But that requires a lot of expensive equipment. And we don't really want to disturb the wetlands too much because as the groups before us explained, the wetlands are very important to the water quality of Wilkins Creek. So for now, we'll just keep looking for organic material to carbon date. Yeah, did everyone see that? That's our soil guy, Zach is watching. Thanks, Zach. Thanks for joining. Yay, um, any questions? Any questions for Kaylin or Leah? Amazing amount of work there. Truly amazing amount of work. Very thorough research, nicely done. The photos were great. Excellent. So thank you too. Very well done. Thank you. All right. All right, yep. Get some blood flow. We're not quite done. So I know what it's like to sit in those seats for a while. So I'm suggesting everybody stand up, get some blood flow. Oh, that's okay. And uh, FBI agents, come on down. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's Hey, Zach, if you're out there, you can hear me. Thanks for coming, man. Did you ask if my dad's there? Uh, oh, sure. Absolutely. All right. My dad's here.
Wow, you all are going back to school. You're getting handouts. <laughs> Be on the lookout for form. 
Um, so the suspect is about 15 inches tall on average. The suspect has a long neck, a triangular chest, a uh, 1 1.6 to 2.4 inch bill, um, a red crest, and black, and it's black with a white stripe down the neck. All right, so now we have some of the vocalizations that you may hear affiliated with Pepperoni. So first we have the territorial. This is a rapid high-pitched noise that will last about five to 10 seconds. It is used for long distance communication between a pair and to tell others that an area is occupied. Then we have so I've got my essay written and I've been working on it for about a week. So now I'm gonna show you how I use Grammarly to Uh, any questions for Danny? Yeah. 
Why does it damage the bird Ooh, good question. That is because of the wind flow. They're trying to escape the wind going into their cavities. Love the humor in your presentation. Still, you guys are impressive birds. Glad to see there at school's forest. Right? Clever. Thanks, Very Jack. Nice. Thank Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. So I was really, really hoping that they would have an opportunity with their time that they spent out there to see the affiliated woodpeckers. Um, over my uh, over my time in the woods up there, I will tell you that we have nesting pairs. And two years ago, I was very fortunate enough. I was out there just kind of enjoying being there. And uh, four affiliated came flying by with the family, and they were literally playing chase through the woods. Aww. Right, so one would drop and fly, and then the next one, and then they and they just kind of went around me. Uh, so if you ever want to see affiliated woodpeckers right on Livonia's campus, you just go up in there, you sit quietly for a half an hour or so, and you might just have them come in and visit you. Okay, so good job. All right, and now for our last presentation of the day. I don't know if you guys can see, if you can see these guys. Look at these crazy people. So we have here uh, Anthony has the uh, pan in his hand. We've got Maddox all geared up, and we've got Wire Pony. They're going to talk to you about the bus garage issue and wildlife. All right, I'm Wyatt. I'm Mads. I'm Anthony. And we're talking about the bus garage issue and wildlife. So what is the bus garage issue? Well, in 2024, we are putting a bus garage on campus and it's gonna be running right along Wilkins Creek. And we believe that if they were to put the bus garage on campus, all it's in a big bedding territory for a lot of animals on campus. And we believe it's going to disturb most of the animals. All right, here's a map of our campus. We have most, all of these dots you see are cameras we have on campus. So we place the punch all over the place and we have them. And Wilkins Creek is running right along here and it runs right across the road. And we have our cameras placed right along the creek to see what animals are crossing the creek and are running along. Also, we think if they were to be placing a bus garage up in here, all the animals that are going to be located up in the northwest corner are going to be uh, moved all the way down into the southwest corner of campus. All right, this is our arsenal of cameras. We had all sorts of cameras doing all sorts of different things by taking pictures, taking videos. We had Bushnell cameras, Browning cameras, wildlife innovation, and camp park. All right, some of the habitats we had on campus was in the northwest corner. It is mainly all invasive honeysuckle and is very thick and it makes it very bushy for animals, big and small game to be hiding out in. You have Wilkins Creek running down right through the middle of it. And there's, it's not very forested, but it's mainly just big bushes of areas and makes it very good for all the animals to run through. In the southwest corner, we have just along like northwest, we have Wilkins Creek running right through it. And it's very, it's way more forested and it's still very thick, but there's just a lot more trees and stuff around that area. All right, here's a drone view that we have. So as you can see in the Northwest, it's more open and it's very bushy-like. You see you have Wilkins Creek running right through it. Then in the Southwest, you can see we have trees and all sorts of stuff in there. It's still super thick. Wilkins run right through it, of course. And some of the ways we decided to place our cameras was the game trails that we have. So we have game trails like you can see right here, they're running right through. This would be a small game trail. It's in a super thick territory territory up in the southwest along
along with this one. This one's in the southwest. You have the game trail running right through here. And also you have a game trail running right through here. These are significant because the game trails the animals run on consistently. So it beatens down a path and makes it very visible to see that animals are moving through. Along here, some more game trails we have. And all these game trails that we're showing you, our trail cameras are right off to the side of them, capturing all the pictures that the animals are coming through. And here's just some more game trails. These are in like the thicker territory, the thicker areas of campus. We have along in here. One game trail's going this way, another one's going this way. And so we put our cameras in a bunch of specific locations. We have this camera right here. It is looking over Wilkins Creek. So any animals were to be crossing the creek on this log right here, we'll be getting pictures of. We have our smaller cameras, as you can see right here. They're on smaller, like shrub-like stuff to get our small game animals. And also sometimes on some game trails, there just wasn't trees to put our cameras up on. So we had to drive stakes in the ground and put them on stakes. And tell me, we'll talk about this in trails. So as you can see right here, this pan was laid down on a really worn out path with some clay and silt to try to capture some prints. Unfortunately, the animals just decided to jump over it or go around it, no matter which way we put it. And, to, and the track ended up then freezing, so it was unusable anymore. So we decided to do the next best thing and look, go looking on the trails for good prints, which took a while, but when we found a good one, we would use a shovel, dig up around, and we would have to bring it back, either put it on the pan that we were bringing back that day, or just try doing a balance act with it on the shovel. But when we got inside, we let it sit for one to two days to let it dry out. Then we had to get plaster and water, and the mixture was two parts of plaster to one part water. We had to carefully pour it on top of the mound with each print in. And this was the coyote print. When it goes around, you can see it better because I painted the actual one, not the picture. But where the orange is, that's the actual pad. The pink is in between the pad. And then the blue is just the extra. And we, so we did it for the coyote. And we also did it for the deer print, which was a lot bigger. And you can see that for the deer print, it caught like grass material in between the pads when the deer step and all the little divots from just the ground and stuff on it. Which will bring us into that animal that we caught on the show. Okay, so our first animal that we caught on trail's camera was the red fox. So the red fox was caught moving across in a long local street pretty much every night. And she usually came through uh, 20 minutes after a rabbit came through. That's what we know. So rabbit also came through here every night. So, and we have some tracks here. These are coming down right under that dock. And then the green is the trail camera that we caught them on, camera E. And then we also caught them on um, camera D, so it shows the same thing say. So we also got a coyote, kind of hard to see there, but we still got him. Um, we caught him on camera E. Um, we saw plenty of tracks all over the woods for us, the coyote, but we never caught him on trail camera until the 15th. Well, that trail camera was up for a while, so we checked it around the first. So one to three. And now we have the common raccoon. So common raccoon was found crossing open street here on a Passover log on camera F. Um, 
He was only caught on the southwest side. He didn't even touch tracks on the northwest side at all. But here's him on camera E. Um, North starts a small game show walking along the open street. So now we have the white tailed deer. So we have them basically on every single camera. We have a big variety of plucks and does. We have a pretty big buck in this picture. I don't know if you can see that too well. But um, does anyone know if you can tell how old the buck is by its buck rub on a tree? No? So, first off, what a buck rub is, is when a deer is in velvet or getting aggressive during the rut, what they will do, what the rut is, is their mating period. They will rub their antlers on a tree. It doesn't really matter in size. A small buck will rub his antlers on a big tree. So, but yes, you can tell how old and how big a buck is by its buck rub because if the buck rub is lower to the ground and higher up the tree, that means it's a big one. If they're kind of like closer together, only really about six to eight inches of tree that's rubbed up, it's usually a smaller spike here. So now we have the common gray squirrel. This was caught on every single trail camera. Uh, these are the two pictures we used. This one was a pretty cool one. We had another as well. We had over 200 pictures of him on camera. So Aww. it was so much fun going with this. So now we have the cocktail rabbit. Like I said, came through pretty much every night on camera E. Camera E was right here where we caught the fox and the raccoon. We also caught the rabbit on camera B. Um, that's the one on the stage. Showed up um, always at night. We never got a day picture of the rabbit. But now we have the mink. We were not expecting to get a mink on camera, but he is a pretty cool one. So we caught him on camera B and camera D. Um, it didn't show up too frequently, but we did get a good picture of him here. Kind of a faint picture of him here, but we still got him. Um, we believe that he was crossing Wilkins Creek from the hardwoods over on the side, going across Wilkins and going into the bushier. Um, kind of denser forested areas with like small animals like mice and the rabbit and squirrels. So now we have a fisher, another animal we were not expecting to get. This is another picture of oh. I bet that's not one of ours. Um, so same thing with him. He was crossing um, crossing Wilkins Creek. Um, we got hardwoods over here on a different property that's not ours, but we believe that they are coming across into the school campus because it is overgrown in some areas. So it holds many different species of small animals that they like to feed on. So now we have our black bear. Um, we kind of made a bet in the beginning of class with this guy right here. Me and Wyatt here told him that there was no way that we had a bear on campus and Wyatt fed him like a hundred bucks or something. <laughs> and this is like the last, last camera we checked and we can play the video here. Oh my God, how unbearably cute. <laughs> I didn't get the camera the next day. So this was the 27th that we had the bear on camera. Um, usually black bears like to go into hibernation around January 1st. Um, sometimes the females will actually stay out longer from hibernation because they are pregnant around the time and they will be giving birth in June. So they will often leave the desk to go give birth during January. And I do believe this is a big male or a big female, but it's all alone right now. So she popped out on camera B, the one on the stage. Well, she was a little higher, but so what's wrong with the bus garage now? So the bus garage now is located way up here on the Avon Lavonia line. And um, the problem with that is it becomes costly to move the bus all the way down past Canisius and all around this area back to Lavonia and then back to the bus garage. So um, if they spend a lot of money in gas and it's just hard on the bus drivers to come all the way down and all the way back to go back up there. So what they wanted to do is move the bus garage on campus in that one location. But the problem with that one location is it's a very important location for animals. It's their bedding ground, it's very high grass and very dense places where they like to bed. And 
and it's a, like kind of crossing points where they cross the road over into their area. So it's really going to divide um, that crossing point for animals if the bus drives just going in that location. So our proposal is instead of clearing, um, instead of clearing that area for the bus drive, we should probably move it into a, a field or something, an area that has nothing really to do with wildlife that we don't use often. So our proposal was kind of like this wet soccer field that no one really uses, and it's kind of out of the way. But you know, the better areas are right up in here. We get some more room. There's not much wildlife in here. We have the corner of the um, elementary school field. It's like 300 yards across, so I'm sure we have plenty of room there. And then we kind of have like a field past the playground, but that, that's not really the best area for it. But it's just hot dog. Yeah. Our conclusion is that overall, that it is important for the animals to have where they've always been living and denning. And the bus route shouldn't be going there because, as a macro vertebrate crew said, the stuff from the bus garage could and will get into Wilkins Creek, will then, which will then end up into Canisius. And it will just drive a whole bunch of animals out of that one area, causing chaos in other animals' territories. And overall, it shouldn't be in that spot. There's other places where it could go. Plus, school just put a BMX dirt trail there, like last, like two years ago. So it'll just be undoing all of their hard work, and it's just not a good idea. And we learned that animals stick to a very tight routine, and that. Some animals only come maybe once or twice a week, while others come every single day. And Kobe, come up and stand next to your buddy. So this was here we caught on trail camera on camera G. And this was a kind of a weird one. So as you can see, Kobe's eyebrows are very nice. And so the deer has eyebrows well as well, which I've never really seen that out of deer before. So I thought that was very stylish cool. deer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you see. Yeah. All right, so you guys have a uh, front back. Oops, where did I go? He just said that was really cool. And you tell you were passionate about wildlife. It's very, really interesting what you got going on. Got a question over here. Yep, what you got? Did your uh, proposal go on to administration? And if so, what was their response? Uh, not yet. Maybe in the near future, but not, not yet. Okay. Yeah. Keep us in the loop. Yeah. We'd right. like to know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, there's two there's two things that uh, they're unaware of. They're unaware of the fact that we water is draining into the creek, and the, and the fact that this bus garage has potential impacts on both wildlife and the natural river. So that's the next step. Right. We're just busy getting the research done for now. Yep. The baseline data. The baseline data. Exactly. Okay. We need that for your proposal. Yes. Uh, love the photos, good stuff, great job. Uh, well, how cool I can really tell you guys are passionate about wildlife and really showcase how much diversity can be held in this small portion of land. If the garage gets built in a proposed area, I'd be interested to see what your cameras detect and what forest remains. Great job. Zach. Awesome. All right. Yeah. The young stuff. The young stuff. All right. Um, so again, that is going to be the conclusion of our show. Um, but before we go, we, I know we're missing a couple of people. Do you want to do this here, or do you want to? Uh, we're going to do it here. Okay. So what we're going to do is get the hell back there, and then we're going to call you up um, one by one. Actually, where is the announcement? So everybody, my students, um, the Canisius Lake Association uh, really appreciate you coming out and presenting our research. Uh, 
it means a lot to them and it's certainly going to be used by the community. So to honor that, they've given each of you a certificate of appreciation. So I'm going to call you up each one by one and you'll get your certificate of appreciation. Okay, so Elliot, come on down. <laughs> Ivy Dudley, these are in no particular order, everybody. Ivy Dudley. Here you go, Agent Dudley. Thank Very you. well done. Kayla DeWater. Oh, over this is a bubble. The way, okay. Uh, Anna Quino. Yeah. Yeah. Take a Shane will lead, everybody. Up on you, my man. Look at the toe. Check it out, everybody. That backpack has chair, a chair. It's a built-in chair. Watch this. I don't know where you see that. There we go. It almost works. Yeah, there we go. Nice. That's pretty slick, man. Uh, Colby Percy. There you go, Colby. Nice job. Wire Pony. There you go, Wire. Nice work. Danny uh, Walters. <laughs> Leo Waterstrap. There you go, Leo. Nice job. Thank you. And everybody, she is not here right now, but Mrs. Tony Garbasic is going to get one. Woo! I think they were kind enough to present with me with one as well. Again, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, really appreciate it and look forward to upcoming years where we continue our research. Have a great night. Be safe.